you. Well, you know, I, I feel very blessed not only to be in this group here today, uh, but also just to be in the job that I'm in. I'm an academic. I get paid for learning. I get paid for sharing what I think I know uh, with other people. And I'm like, what a job. I get to sit in my office and talk to scholars like Dr. John Zach, and I'll say, you know, I noticed this thing growing on the top of my skin. Will it kill me? Or whatever. And he can tell me those things. And I ask him, which mushroom should I eat? And he says, well, don't eat the ones like this. And I thought, where else? What other environment could you be in where you get to learn, you get to be paid to learn, you get to hang around other people who are insane about knowing more and learning more. Uh, and I think, what a, what a neat opportunity to, to have that. I'm very humbled to be in this room uh, because I know that we have scholars from all different kinds of disciplines in here. A lot of hard scientists. I hear we even have a philosopher in the room. How marvelous. Uh, I'm more from the social sciences. So I'm a number of cruncher. I do research on how people do social things, particularly communication. So if you'll notice from your schedule today, there's going to be three sessions on, at least three, on communication in science. And I'm going to look more at the persuasion. John and I have talked several times about communicating with people. How do you get people to listen to you? What do you do if they do not agree with you? How do you still communicate uh, with people? And so I'm going to look, take more of a persuasion focus. Uh, Dr. Hassel and Dr. Hayhoe will take a little bit different focus that will probably be even more specific to some of the research that you're doing uh, in that regard. So we're going to take a little bit of a look at you know, particularly with a specific topic, we're going to look at a specific topic today, but it's going to be more broad stroked such that you could use this not only with this topic, uh, but with other topics as well. Uh, you know, it may not be to you, but it is to some people. This could be a controversial topic, couldn't it? <laughs> could it not? Could there be more than one perspective on this particular topic. So as we go through today, I want us to look at three questions, and I'll show you what those are in just a bit. But I want us to look at those three questions in the context of this particular topic, because I think perceived that most of you are in here because you're interested in that particular topic. Here's one perspective on that particular topic. You look at these and you see what you think. What about this perspective? That's another perspective, isn't it? On the exact same topic. And it's because this particular topic in terms of climate change does let us elicit some different perspectives. And so one of the things as we go through today, I want you to keep the fact that this topic could have different perspectives on it in mind as we go through and talk about how could you be in a persuasive type of way knowing that some people laughed at the first at the cartoons and then decidedly the room got a little bit more cold when we got to the second group of topics as I, as I thought that it might. So I want us to look at three rhetorical questions, if you will, uh, that have to do with dealing with this topic when you're presenting your research, when you're talking about this with other people, uh, three specific areas that I want us to think about. And with each one of these areas, I'd like to introduce some rhetorical theory, some rhetorical principles that come out of research. Uh, so this is not just a wouldn't it be loverly kind of, kind of presentation. I want us to actually get into the research that backs some of the comments that we're going to look at. We're going to look at when you're trying to deal in a persuasive situation, one of the things you need to think about is who's coming to this party and what are they bringing with them? Okay. We'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit more in a bit. Why would these people listen to you giving a persuasive topic, particularly taking the position that you're taking? Why would they listen to you? Right? And then I also want to talk about what if they not just a little bit disagree, 
What if they really disagree? All right? So those are the particular areas I want us to look at. And we're going to look at communication and rhetorical theory and principles for each one of these. And so I hope you can gain something that you would find useful uh, in that regard. Let's look at the first one. Who's at the party? I'm speaking metaphorically here. Bottom line, we're talking about who is your audience? Who is your audience and what did they come to your presentation with? What baggage did they bring with them? What equipment? What food? Intellectual food did they bring with them? What did they bring to your party? Well, you say, well, before we get into what they brought, let's think a little bit about what is persuasion. We have to look at that before we think about who's at the party, right? So persuasion. Hmm. Persuasion is the process of trying to change people's attitudes, their values, and or their beliefs. That's pretty serious stuff, right? Persuasion is trying to change their attitudes, things they like, things they don't like, their beliefs, things that they believe this is, this isn't, you know, their view of reality, I believe this, I don't believe that. Are there value systems? What is right? What is true? What is just? What is virtuous? That goes down deep, deep into my heart. And so sometimes people will try to persuade in those particular domains as well. All right, so with that in mind, then let's look and see who comes to the party and what they might come with. Somebody asked me, where were you raised? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Texas. Some unique things about grew up in Texas that aren't probably specific to everybody in this room. Let me just hear where some of you are from. I read some of the program. I know we have some people from Indiana. Where else are you from? Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Where else are you from? England. England! <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, can anybody beat that in terms of distance? <laughs> Wow, you get the prize. Everybody buying her supper. Everybody that gets get far. Nepal! Oh, wow. oh, that's pretty far away as well. Yes. All right, where else? China. China! Yes. Wow, I didn't realize we were as international as we are, but we're from all over the world. It's wonderful. Where else? Everybody else in Texas? <laughs> no. no. Everybody else shy? Where else are you from? Minnesota! We think it's cold in London. It is not. <laughs> it is not cold in London. It's a little word called Duluth that I've heard before. Yes. All right. Where else? Oregon. Oregon. Beautiful place, Oregon. Yes. All right. And the rest of you are shy. Okay. We're going to find out afterwards. We may have some sessions where you actually get to say that. Have you ever noticed that people do things differently in different places? I went from Texas, and in Texas, everybody's supposed to be real friendly, and you greet people on the street, and you say howdy and whatever. I went to New York City, and I'm seeing people on the subway. Hey, how's it going? And they're reaching for their guns. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the way we do things up there. They don't, you don't say anything to strangers. You walk on by. People have different cultural norms. People have different cultural myths. When I grew up, I was always told by my parents, what you eat, as you just have, you can't go swimming for 30 minutes. I heard an hour. <laughs> <laughs> or if you do, what will happen? You will die. You will have to know why something will happen. <laughs> you never made that clock clear what would happen. But you'll sink to the bottom like a rock, right? And so that was a cultural myth that I grew up with. I still don't know if it's true or not. And I always wait for at least 30 minutes before I go swimming after I've eaten. And so you see, people come from different places, they have different cultural norms, they have different, sometimes different beliefs, belief systems in terms of what is polite, what isn't polite, what is a custom here, what is not a custom there. Um, well, we'll single one out. Right. So, but you need to know, if you're trying to persuade somebody, you need to know from whence they come, do you not? You need to know as much about what are their current belief systems. What are they thinking in terms of their attitudes or their values or their beliefs towards your particular topic? If you think about it, attitudes, values, and beliefs are kind of like concentric circles. Attitudes, what we like and dislike, is kind of on the outside. And that's pretty much the easiest to change what somebody likes and then don't like. 
Remember the food that you used to like as a child that you hate now, or the food that you hated as a child, and you think, oh, that's pretty good, actually, now. And so you eat it now. Attitudes are easier to change, particularly if you put chocolate on it. I saw some chocolate. <laughs> Whatever it is, put chocolate on it. Oh. Change that attitude. <laughs> Beliefs are a little bit harder to change because that goes into what you think is and isn't. Is this bad? Is this bad for you? Is it not? That sort of thing. Uh, and so when you look at those things, those are a little harder to change. If you get down to somebody's fundamental values, which is at the center of the core, those are very hard to change. And if somebody has a value system that has a disagreement with whatever you're talking about, climate change or whatever, you're going to be very hard for us to change that because that goes down to the very belief of what is right or wrong. Does that make sense? All right, so you have to keep those in mind. So making a list, you say, what or what value was it for me to write these things down? Because if you're going to be a persuader, you're going to need to know this and do a lot more research than that into who it is that you're talking to. I want us to look at a particular uh, theory, uh, persuasion theory, called the social judgment theory. This still is talking about who's at the party and what are they bringing with them. This is a very interesting theory, and what it, it posits a lot of things, and it's a very complex theory. Uh, one, of, one, one of the things it posits is that persuasion is a process. You don't just do it like switching on a light and switching off a light. A lot of times it's a long-term thing. Multiple messages, multiple interactions and what have you. And so it will posit that. But it posits some other things that I, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, within this theory, they look at people and they say, you know, from a social science perspective or from a persuasion perspective, there are at least three latitudes or ranges, and I drew them for you here. The one latitude on any topic, it doesn't matter if it's climate change or whatever it is, there will be one latitude of rejection. And this is where the person is rooted in that particular area. This is their predisposition towards your topic. All right? You see the people in the top there. You kind of get a clue what they think about things. <laughs> Whatever it is, all right? You're looking at that, and you can kind of get a clue. There's a range of that. Your position on climate change or whatever else might be rooted in there. Now, I will say this. It might be your rejection, but it might be kind of close to here. Or it may be way over there. It could be in a range. Not only your position might be in there, but any arguments you hear, you might say, well, that falls in my life to your projection. Or I really reject that, or I, I'm not sure about that. I sort of disagree with that one, or whatever. So that's the latitude of rejection. There's a latitude of acceptance. Can you just do something for me? Can you just kind of go, oh, and be great? This is when you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> they agree with you. Oh, and you get in and you tell them your stuff, and they love what you say about climate change or whatever else it is, all right? They love that. This is the latitude of acceptance. Their basic position on the topic is in there. Any arguments you hear that kind of go in this area, they put it in that box, all right? So then there's another latitude of non-commitment, non-commitment, or neutral, or I flat don't care. I just don't <laughs> care. Whatever it is, all right? Have you seen that perspective? In fact, you've seen all of them on climate change. I totally accept that. I don't really care about it or totally wrong, bogus, whatever, right? So you've seen all of those. And you say, okay, if I'm going to try to persuade people, what is a reasonable expectation of myself in terms of my persuasion abilities? I teach classes on business communication, and one of the things that they're assigned to do is to do a persuasion speech, persuasion presentation, typically in business and professional settings. And they'll come up to me with their topics, and we'll do some audience analysis in the class, and they'll say, <clears throat> everybody in here is against what I'm saying, so that must be a bad persuasion topic. And I said, what at all? Depends on what it is you're trying to do. Are you trying to preach to the converted? Are you trying to reinforce people that already believe like you, or are you trying to change them? And I tell them, no, that's not necessarily a persuasion topic, even if everybody in the room disagrees with you. It's just thinking you need to approach it differently. What is reasonable? Is it reasonable to take somebody from way over here, reject, and by the end of your presentation, with your data, whatever it is, and then expect that they're going to end up over here? That happens every once in a while. <laughs> Usually there's a bright light with it and a whole changing of lights and a changing of how you dress and what you eat. That doesn't happen very often though, right? 
All right, so more often than not, you might say, well, somebody rejected this, and I gave a persuasion speech, and I moved them from here to here. They're still in the rejection zone, that I'm moving them from here to here. Or, like everybody vote, looks for in top political races in the United States, they're trying to go after those middle voters, right? So maybe they're right here, maybe I moved them from rejected. Well, I don't know, but I don't care. All right, well, maybe you move them. Any movement at all is persuasion. Does that make sense? And if you contact them over and over, over a period of time, you may move them, you may not, all right? What if you move somebody from agree to disagree, or from year to year, or from year to there, or from year to there? Any movement at all is persuasion. Does that make sense? So you need to not be discouraged if you give a presentation and you don't say, well, they just left and I totally changed their life right here. That's, that's harder to do. It is hard to do. It can happen, but it's a lot harder to do. So when you think of the audience, you think, who came to the party? What did they bring with them? And you think, where are they on the ranks, and what is it reasonable for you to be able to accomplish in the amount of contact that I'm going to have these people in? You know, frankly, we look at commercials all the time that they run, all the time. And if we wanted to start singing jingles and stuff from commercials, I bet I could hum a few and you would go, it's that product, it's that product, it's that product. Do you own one of those? Uh, no. But do you know what it is? Yes. And so you've been exposed to it multiple times, multiple times, multiple times, right? So, persuasion theory. Social judgment theory is kind of cool, especially as you dig into it, especially as you think, okay, how can I persuade other people? Another question why in the world would anybody, particularly your audience, want to listen to you? <laughs> why would they want to listen to you? Well, let's talk about it just for a second. Why would they not want to listen to you? Thoughts, comments. Why would people not want to listen to you? Preconceived notions, and by the way, they're not the only ones that have preconceived notions, don't we all? But they may have some preconceived notions to say, uh, hmm. I'm going to go do something else instead. I'm going to listen to something else instead. You better believe that's exactly right. What else? Yes, sir. Their interest? Their interest. I don't really care about that. <laughs> or I really care about that. All right? And so two different responses. You better believe it. Interest level. And frankly, if they're not interested, part of your job as a persuader is to show them how to be interested. And frankly, most people are interested in something that affects them. So... Say again. <laughs> That's true, and I'm going to accept that as the most metaphorical sentence. <laughs> they would love to listen to you if you are boring. All right? And that's the neat thing about higher ed. Even if you are boring, you still get boring. <laughs> but I hope you wouldn't want to do that. Don't, don't, accept, don't embrace the boringness. <laughs> What if they didn't believe you, or they, they lacked, they thought your sincerity wasn't there? You know, I, I, I don't want to listen to you because I don't think you're sincere, or I don't think that you're going to tell me the right stuff. Uh, that might be another reason that they may not want to listen to you, uh, because they, they have some doubts in those particular areas. So what is required for them to listen to you? The opposite of that, interest factor. Something that shows how this applies to me. If it doesn't apply to me, I may not have time for it. If it applies to me, I'll listen to it. It interests me. It would benefit me. It's something that I could gain from. And another thing that might be, and this is the important rhetorical device I want us to look at, is the concept of credibility. If you are not credible, nobody wants to hear you, right? And if you are, they want to hear you. Now tell me this, what is credibility? You know it when you see it, right? Let's try to define it. What is credibility? You know, we want to have that as a persuasion, right? How do you know if somebody's credible? Ah, yes. yes. Well, I trust this person to tell me the truth. Yes, let's come to that one. Tell me more about the team about And that kind of ties into that. You said verification? Reputation. Reputation, okay. So that ties very well to that. 
Your qualifications, what is your degree in? Is your degree in food and nutrition and you're going to be a climate scientist? Hmm. Well, maybe. Maybe that could be your hobby. But, and maybe you know all about it. But people are going to look at your visa first. And they're going to say, what do you mean? Ah, indeed. Practical application. Are you credible? If you can show how that's practically applied. I had some colleagues when I worked at West Virginia University that actually did a factor analysis on a variety of items designed trying to find out what is credibility. And people have been arguing about what it is since antiquity. It's a multifaceted construct. So yes, Tommy. I was just gonna say a little bit about what you're talking about. Are there other qualifications you would have to be to be a Yes, it can. Today identify Oh, you're so, well, actually, you just kept the rest of my talks on. <laughs> you're so on. You're so on. When my, some colleagues of mine actually factor analyzed uh, doing some research on what is credibility, they kind of they kind of came up with a definition, and then they're going to come down to the dimensions that you mentioned, all right? According to this particular research and this defining uh, uh, encapsulation of the construct, Credibility is the attitude that the audience has about you and about what you're talking about at any given time. It can switch. You can start out with credibility, by the time you get to the end, you're done. Or you start out with no credibility and you have to build it. So it is a processal thing, but it's not something like, hey, I came to this talk today and I so came prepared because I bought a whole boatload of credibility in my pocket. <laughs> it's something that they feel towards you. They do not have it unless they give it. Sense. So you say, well, what, what pieces of credibility exist? Well, they factor analyzed it down to basically two. I found another one I threw in, but I wanted to show you what they came up with. They said, bottom line, credibility, when you're trying to persuade somebody, you <coughs> want to know what your character is, and that goes into the trust. All right? Are you a person that's real shady? Are you trying to publish something and you'll even lie about your stats to get it published? All right, have you heard of that in academe before? I have. Uh, it's not pleasant. It's very ugly. But some people get like, I'll just kind of make up these results, and nobody knows stats, and so they don't know what I'm doing. Well, other people do know stats, and they will try to verify and check out and replicate it. And if they can't, you know, you can say you produce cold fusion, but maybe you didn't. <laughs> or maybe there were some constraining things, but if they don't trust your character. They don't trust you as a believable, trustworthy person, then you're not going to have credibility with them. Now, how many people have you just loved to death, but you didn't think they were going to think about what they were talking about? <laughs> have you ever had somebody in, like, teach you how to do something and you realize two seconds in you know more about it than they do? <laughs> right? Or you go, you know, like somebody teaching you how to snow ski or something. You go, hey, you know, how do you do this? Well, you throw a glass and you go, you don't even know. You're just you're just saying what you think, but you don't know. I mean, you've been around people before. You talk to people all the time. They have a question about this. Oh, I'm so glad I'm going to help you. And you see, they, they want to help. They have a good heart. They have a good motivation, but they are absolutely clueless about how to fix your laptop that just broke or whatever. You know more about that than they do. You're calling them for help. All right? So you have credibility if you can do it. Now, if you can do it, if they think you're lying to them, you don't have credibility. You see what I'm saying? So it takes both of those contracts. Can I trust you? Are you a virtuous person? And are you lying to me or not? Now, I would add in this last one as well. Concern for well-being of audience. When you're trying to persuade somebody, are you trying to do something to help them? Or are you trying to do something to help you? You know, I get these calls all the time on telemarketing voice and how hard it is <laughs> you have to figure out when people are eating and then call in. And so you ring the doorbell and they're doing something. I got a call on my phone today from somewhere. And I thought, how'd you get my cell phone number? I'm not even going to pick up. Because if you're a telemarketer, you won't leave a message. <laughs> so I didn't. So I got this thing on my phone. I thought, I'm going to let the FBI track that one. I see where that came from. I don't know if I was in that state. In that state, it confused me. <laughs> <laughs> so, character confidence, character confidence, credibility. You have it if you have both of those. Let me ask you this, and we don't have time to do this, I was going to ask you. Have there been times in the past where there have been major science fails? 
So what I've got, I want to ask these people over here to think about what are people's attitudes, values, and beliefs about science in general. Have there been historical things where science has said this, and it turned out not to be that, right? So if you know that about people, and you know where they're coming from, you can kind of understand. If you say something to them about climate science, and they go, oh, this is kind of like using leeches to help cure you. You suck out the bad <laughs> right? So if you see people that have a whole perspective of science like that, you can see where they might come from a, a, a position where they might not be real eager to hear what you thought. I have a colleague here at Tech that tells me he works with people who work on the farm. And the science people from Tech will go tell them, hey, you really need to do this, and the farmers go, no, that's not true. I don't own this land. I've been doing this for years, and I know pretty well that won't work. And they're going to hear at Tech, they're doing all this crop science, and they figured out how to do things, and the farmers won't believe them. And I thought, how interesting. So you have to know where your credibility is in a particular topic especially in something like climate science. All right, third area that I want us to look at. Third question. What do you do if somebody really, really, really disagrees with you and you are trying to persuade them? All right? That's the toughest, actually, that's the toughest and the most persuasion of all is if you can get somebody who doesn't believe in what you're saying and by the time you're through, at least they're neutral. Or at least they think, there may be something to that. That's the most awesome persuasion. It's hard. It's the hardest persuasion, but it's the most awesome persuasion. Uh, so they just disagree with you. Well, one of the things you might try to use with them is to show them if they really, really disagree. Well, argue with this. Do you see these numbers? Argue with that. Sorry. Argue with that. Okay. I have to tell you this quickly. Remember, I do social science research, and so for years and years and years, I would work with graduate teaching assistants, and I would say, you need to look like a teacher. I'm not going to tell you what that looks like, but you need to be professional, dress professional, act professional. You do not party with your students. You absolutely do not date your students, all right? So I would say all those things. And I would say, you know, being professional as a teacher, well, I mean, you have to wear a tie every day, but you need to look like a teacher. And they go, oh, no. We need to look just like the students because they'll believe us more if we're more like one of them. Not, I go, hmm, I think it's a good thought. Dress professionally, look like a teacher, or not dress professionally, just keep me in the room. I asked a lot of people, I said, you know, I still think it's a team. I only sat in my large lecture class. I just look like one of them. She goes, hey, she's pretty good. I graduated a car a long time ago. And so I thought, well, huh. Let's just do a little research on that. So I did a research project where we looked at students' responses to how their teachers were dressed, particularly how their teacher, graduate teaching assistants were dressed, and how, what impacts that had on class, not only in cognitive learning, affective learning, likelihood for missing behaviors, the whole works. Now, I did number crunching on that. What do you think I found? What do you think I found? Hmm. Well, it just so turned out that the students who looked at teachers that were dressed just like them or just kind of slobbed out to teach because they really didn't think it mattered. In my class, the cognitive learning, sorry. Cognitive learning, affective learning was lower. The likelihood of student misbehaviors like skipping classes or why do I have to do this or texting during class or whatever was up. So I thought, mm -hmm. so I came back to my graduate students and I said, <laughs> Go to the back. Go to the back. Tell me, take it back. Right. You clean up a little bit. I don't care if you wear a tie or not, but I do think you need to look at a teacher. And I said, look at the numbers. Well, they may not believe the numbers for a variety of reasons. They may say, well, you can throw that data and that logic at me all day long. I don't care because I don't believe your numbers. I think you've got some error variants there. <laughs> You know, you must have conducted your research in a weird way that got you the outcome you were looking for. So I don't buy your data. I don't buy your logic. Now, I do in that particular case. Just keep showing it to them and say, hey. So it occurs to me in this last question, when people really disagree with you, you're trying to persuade them? Ah, it may be that persuasion involves more than data. So you just shove numbers in front of their face and charts in front of their face and then say, poof, you can take that all away because I still don't believe you. I'm still not persuaded. 
So it occurs to me, and frankly to some rhetorical theorists, that it may be more than data. I put this in, I thought this was pretty profound because I wrote it. Persuasion may be strongly affected by something or some things other than your persuasion arguments. Now, I'm all about your persuasion arguments. I'm all about that. You build your case, you defend it, you justify it. If there's holes in it, you better have an answer for it, particularly if you're defending your dissertation or whatever. You're going to get your stuff ready. I'm all for that. But I think with persuasion, particularly on topics like this, climate science, or other topics that might be controversial in the future, then you're going to have to go past that. Here's how you don't go past that. This is not persuasion, all right? Do you see that? Do you think good arguments are being used? Oh, I bet they are. Some really good arguments are being used. How much persuasion is going on? Nope. No. Most, most of you have probably been to other countries where they speak a language different than yours. And I remember growing up, I was a stupid little high school kid, and I was in another culture, and I was trying to, to go to the store and buy something, and, and I realized that the clerk didn't speak the same language I did. And so to try to compensate for that, I repeated the same request of trying to buy a toothbrush. Went all the way to that country and forgot my toothbrush. So I'm going in the store trying to buy a toothbrush. I said, do you have a toothbrush? And I could tell very quickly they didn't understand English. So in a very brilliant moment of epiphany, I thought, well, I'll just say it louder. <laughs> it didn't. It did not. All right? So you can increase your volume. That's not persuasive. In fact, if anything, it shows you that you're losing this or not. You're losing the argument if you're raising your volume. If you're getting shrill, if you're doing ad hominem attacks, which means you're starting to say, who does your hair? Can you dress yourself? Or you play bubbles? You know, you start saying stuff like that. That shows that you're not being persuasive, and if anything, you're probably hurting your argument. Hostile, that doesn't persuade. If it did, people would do it all the time, right? Hey, you don't believe me. I just get hostile on the door. Well, when you got hostile, I said this the door. I'm persuading. I know what you mean. I'm with you, all right? So that's, these are not persuasive things, all right? So, well, what persuasive things would you have that might be? Well, if they really, really don't believe you, you know, and you start yelling at them, this is what you're going to get, right? You're going to get, and all of a sudden you don't engage with them anymore. Um, I've heard, there was an old song years ago that said, we both can't be wrong on this. <laughs> you heard that song? Oh, All right, so how about some rhetorical theory that might help us if somebody really, really gets what you're talking about. Kenneth Burke is a noted rhetorical theorist, um, and he said something I thought was very, very interesting. The progress of human enlightenment, enlightenment can go no further than in picturing people not as vicious, but as mistaken. All right? Think about it. The process of human enlightenment can go no further than in picturing people not as vicious to disagree with you, but simply as mistaken. Take a look at these pictures, right? And then I'm not really familiar with it. I couldn't be any good with that part. Or in here you have a cartoon, virtually every science in the world, and they're looking at a climate denier, and they're saying either he is that dense or he doesn't believe in gravity. <laughs> and over here you got a Newsweek WEAK. Saying, huh, I'm fine, I'm fine. You guys are just kidding. Go for it. Trust us this time. You see what's going on with these two sides? They've gone past some of the arguments and they've gone into denigrating or being louder or shriller to the people from the other side. How much persuasion is going on? Probably none. Now, this, this position over here makes all these people say, yeah, over here, yeah, stupid. <laughs> uh, it makes everybody that's in your camp already pretty happy, but it's not doing anything to persuade. And so the process of human enlightenment, seeing the other people not necessarily as threats or vicious, but as some people that may may not understand. That's a whole different way of persuading people. A whole different way of persuading. A little bit further, persuasion is typically seen as rhetoric, but similarly defined. Um, 
I thought this was kind of cool. If you look, if people really don't believe in what you're saying, they look at it like this and like that. Viri, bonus vicende, caritas. Wow. You get that What essentially that means is a good man speaking well. That's how Quintilian, who was a Roman warrior at one time, translated a good person. Okay, a good person is speaking well. Um, a good person, that means you trust them. You think, hey, I don't believe you. I have a different perspective, but at least I know you're not conspiracy trying to sneak up and rob me. Uh, you're not trying to pull the wolves out of my eyes. And you're speaking eloquently in such a way that doesn't denigrate somebody that disagrees with you, right? You can speak to a, a conference, and if I told an Aggie joke in here right now, there'd be an Aggie in here that might be offended. So you just know <laughs> not to tell them, right? <laughs> I have a whole story about that, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Here's what Kenneth Burke says, and I think it's very interesting. You persuade a person, he said, man, you persuade a person insofar as you talk his language. Can you speak the language of the other person? And I'm not talking about English and Spanish. I'm talking about the region of the country, attitudes, cultural beliefs, that sort of thing. Can you speak that person's language with what you're trying to persuade them? Because if you can, you're further down the road to being able to make Talking their language by how you speak, by how you gesture, by how you do your attitude, by how you identify your ways with that person. Ooh, let's talk about that. Have you ever heard somebody say the comment before? I really identify with them. Have you heard that before? Identification is a powerful concept. What are you saying when you're talking about identification? Remember junior high? Remember how everybody wanted to dress? Else. <laughs> you look at this picture here, and you see a little guy right here that identifies with Spider Man and he wants to be like me and has similar value systems. I identify with him, I have commonality with him. I want to be like that person. Little Disney princesses, we go to Disney World and they see the real Ariel <laughs> or whatever, they want to be like him. I remember being abroad one time. And I was driving through South Africa, and they all had different cars. <laughs> and I saw a Ford pickup. A Ford pickup truck? I don't even drive one. But I know Ford. Hey, Ford pickup truck. We can talk. <laughs> we can understand with one another. You see the point? If you can establish identification, even if they don't agree with you, if there's some areas where they do, I know how these people think. You ever seen Anne of Green Gables? If you haven't, that's fine. But if you did, it was a concept in a movie called Kindred Spirit. You ever run across another person you meet for the first time and think, I'm going to like you just <laughs> You and I, we are like the same. Other people say, oh, you know who you are. You're an alien. I'll never right? Uh, so identification, the ability to be similar, the ability to understand how they talk, how they think, uh, what is their belief system, their patterns of thinking, and what have you? Identification leads towards something called consubstantiation, which is another concept uh, that Kenneth Burke writes in his rhetoric of motives. Consubstantiation. Refer to you consubstantiation? Consubstantiation. All right. What this means is a sharing of substance. Okay, so when you identify with someone, you share substance with them, which means they're going to listen to you persuade and talk a lot more than they do to give you share substance. Let me, let me get it to you in a, in a, a graphic of a Venn diagram. Do you use Venn diagrams? Show relationships if you're looking for relationships or regression. Here's two different people. And they're different, and there is no sharing of substance. If you're crunching numbers, you're saying, how much shared variance do they have? None. What's an R squared on that? I don't know. It's a big R squared. Doesn't look like much. I don't think that'll cut this. You better do your dissertation. I'm not going to find something else. All right, so instead of that, what about this? When you do the Venn diagram and you see what's in the middle, here's what's different in that variable, here's what's different in that variable, and here's where these variables overlap. Those of you that don't run, you run correlation, regression data, Pearson's, you do some of that. 
This is your R squared right in the middle. Here's your variance accounted for. And the more of that you have, the more when you wiggle one of the variables, it wiggles the other variable, right? That's a goofy way to say it. But that's true with people as well. And if you identify with them, and the way they think, the way they talk, and the way they reason, and you identify with them, then you're going to share more substance with them, and they're going to be more open to your persuasion than if you don't do it that way. Remember the yelling people a while ago? That is not shared variance. You see what I'm saying? So what we have to do when we're persuading something, somebody who has a radically different perspective than, than we do, is learn how to identify with them. You know, and I think you're wrong, but I can identify. Somebody said that to me, I'd be upset as well. I took a picture of some veterans of World War II, and I thought, you see a lot of differences between these gentlemen? Differences in race, differences in where they were from, differences in outfit. And every single one of those guys went to battle at a certain time, and so they identify with people. You ever thought of how tough it might be to be very elderly and nobody knows what you're talking about anymore, other than they read it in a history book? But you lived it, and you're around somebody else that lived it, all right? I'm reminded by my wife all the time. She says, do not talk to me about pain and childbirth because you don't know a thing about it. I said, well, I've read it. Yeah, but have you thought about it? And she said, you know, if you've had a child and somebody else has had a child, you all can talk. And she said, really? She said, you're a good person. And she did not say anything. And I said, you know, I went to the doctor the other day and they did this medical test and I was so embarrassed. And she said, don't talk to me about being embarrassed in exams. Women have exams all the time. They, you just have to get up. And yours is nothing. <laughs> they gave you a shot for crying out loud. And you're embarrassed? What? You know, and I thought, hmm. Because I can't share that substance. I can't understand that at a deep level. But if I can understand that at a deep level, then I'm going to be more persuasive. Does that make sense? And so when you look at people and you say, well, the Bible can disagree with you, but you can get shrill or you can yell at them or whatever you want. But you're not doing any persuading. You've been watching TV and watching the political rallies and people beating each other up and loud in the street. How much persuasion is going on? Absolutely nothing. Everybody's just yelling and getting angry and calling names and whatever. And I thought, if you're really into doing persuasion, you're going to have to think who came to the party and what did they bring with them? All right? What are they what they want to listen to? What is your credibility virtuously or competently? use that word. And then thirdly, what about my identification with them? Even if I don't agree with them, what about my identification with them? And so if you look at these three things that we've looked at, there's rhetorical theory 